Welcome to a new lesson of thermal fluid science. We continue our discussion on transient heat conduction. And we recall that the first thing we have to do for this time, type of problems, we need to look at uh, the BO number. So the BO number is the non-dimensional number that's defined as H times LC divided by KS where H is the convection coefficient, LC is the typical length scale of the problem, and Ks is the thermal conductivity of the material. We want to look at the BO number because we want to check whether the lump system analysis can be used. If this approximation is valid, then the temperature can be approximated to be only a function of time, not of space. So we look at the BO number, if the BO number is a very small number, and for engineering applications usually smaller than 0 0.1, then the lump system approximation is a very good, is valid. Whereas if the BO number is a number of order 1, so a finite number, then the temperature must be considered as a function of space and time. Today we are talking about the case when the BO number is not small. So in this case, the temperature depends on space and time. So both must be considered. But we focus on problems that are 1D in space and depending on time, but they have also a symmetry. So for example, we consider the case of plain wall case of a cylinder or case of a sphere. And the symmetry is both the geometrical symmetry but also a thermal symmetry. Let's look at the case of a plane wall. We are familiar with this geometry, we have seen it before. So we have a plane wall that's very long in this direction, that's much longer than this direction x. And initially, the temperature of the plane wall is Ti, and that's uniform here. But then at a certain time, the temperature of the surfaces on the left and on the right is set to T infinity. That's a constant temperature. So how does the temperature evolve over time? This is a cooling problem. So the part of the plane wall that's exposed to the exterior, the cold exterior, then we'll have a lower temperature where the core here will not feel the cooling coming from the outside. So the temperature profiles will assume a certain this form and eventually when time goes to infinity then the, every point of the plane wall will reach asymptotically a temperature t infinity. We note here, as I said, there is a symmetry in space but also a symmetry of the temperature of the temperature profile because the boundary conditions are the same t infinity on both sides so what's the differential equation that describes this problem well we've seen it before it is the conduction equation in one dimension in 1d so we have the second derivative of the temperature with respect of x equal to 1 divided by alpha where alpha is the thermal diffusivity, times the partial derivative of the temperature with respect to time. And we note that these are partial derivative signs because we want to consider partial derivatives because the temperature depends on both time and space. So let's go back to the plane wall problem. And the analysis is very similar to for case of a cylinder or sphere. So this is the heat conduction equation in 1D. What are the boundary conditions? Well, allocation x equals zero, that's the mid-plane of the, of the plane wall. If we remember that line is a line of symmetry, so we have partial t partial x equals zero, because that's, these are the boundary conditions that must be used in the case of thermosymmetry. 
the point of x equal l, which is the point where the wall ends, and so that's the surface of the wall, then see the outside, and we assume that outside there is some flow, and this flow is characterized by a convection coefficient h. So at that point, we have a mixed boundary condition, also called Robin boundary conditions. This boundary condition simply expresses the energy balance at the surface. So we have conduction must be equal to convection. This is a transient problem, so we also need an initial condition. So we need to specify the temperature at time equals zero. And we assume that the temperature at time equals zero is uniform, equal to Ti. So how many parameters we have for this problem? So we have a temperature that depends on space and time, and we actually have six parameters. So we have the thermal diffusivity alpha, we have the thermal conductivity of the material K, we have H, the convection coefficient, T infinity, the temperature of the fluid that's cooling or warming up the plate, L, which is the thickness, actually the half thickness of the plane, and Ti, that's initial temperature of the plane. So one way to solve this problem is to analyze the dependence on the temperature profile and the evolution over time as we change these parameters. This is a very te tedious task, so we can be clever and actually express the differential problem in non-dimensional form. So for example, we introduce a big X, that's a non-dimensional coordinate, and that's the ratio between X and L. We have theta, a non-dimensional temperature, defined in this way, and also we have tau, which is also called the Fourier number. It's a non-dimensional time, defined as T times alpha divided by L squared. So we have defined these three variables that are without dimension. And what we do, we substitute x, big X, tau, and theta inside the heat conduction equation. This is actually a very good exercise that you should do by yourself. So the differential problem takes this simplified form. You can see here that 1 over alpha has disappeared, and also the boundary condition at the surface, the conduction convection boundary condition has assumed a more compact form. It's interesting to note here that we have now the BO number in the problem. So the BO number has come out from the, from the analysis. So for the dimensional problem, we actually had six parameters that we could vary by here, thanks to the scaling in non-dimensional form, we have the theta, the temperature that depends on big X, the non-dimensional space coordinate, and tau, the Fourier number, which is a scaled non-dimensional time. And we only have one parameter, the BO number. So you can see that this problem, this solution contains all the information that the solution in dimensional space contains by just written in more compact form. Let's take a look a bit more at the boundary condition. See here now, I said we have a BO number. What happens if the BO number is tending to zero? It's very, very small. Then the partial theta, partial x, so the gradient of the non-dimensional temperature with respect to the scaled non-dimensional coordinate x is equal to zero. So we have uh, the case of the lump system analysis because if we impose no gradient of temperature in space at the surface and it, same thing we impose it at the line of symmetry because it's a symmetry line then the temperature gradient must be zero everywhere which is exactly the approximation that we use in the lump system analysis so this is another way to prove that in this limit, as the BO number goes to zero, 
we can approximate the temperature de to depend only on time. Now, a word of caution here. Because initially, when we defined the BO number, we wanted to check if the lump system analysis was valid. We defined the BO number as LC times H divided by thermal conductivity. And LC, the typical length, was defined as the ratio between the volume and the surface area. And, but actually, since we are looking at BO number that's very, very small, so it's asymptotic limit, any characteristic length could be taken. So for example, for a sphere or for a cylinder, LC could be taken to be the uh, diameter. So this is okay if the BO number is much, much smaller than one. But when the BO number is finite, then we must solve the differential equation. In the case of a plane wall must be in Cartesian coordinates for a cylinder in cylindrical coordinates for a sphere in spherical coordinates. So if we solve the differential equation in that case, then the BO number must be computed with LC equal to the length scale that's actually used to scale the length to simplify the problem. So that's very important to remember. So how do we solve the conduction equation? Well, there's a technique called separation of variables. And in that case, thanks to this analysis, we obtain a series solution with an infinite number of terms. But actually for engineering purposes, we are interested in solution for a Fourier time larger than 0 0.2. So the solution has this form, so it has a cosine here and also an exponential, so uh, that decays in time. So in case of cylinder and sphere, we also have similar solutions. So to solve this problem, we can just use this solution, so the first term in the series, or we can use as many uh, terms of the series as we want to get a very accurate solution. But most of the times we can use also a visual representation of the solution. It's called the Eisler chart. So the Eisler chart is very useful to uh, plot the solution. So here we, we have theta, usually at the mid plane, and as a function of the non-dimensional time tau. And since the BO number is the parameter, then for each BO number, then we have a different line. And as the BO number goes to zero, the, the curves just move to the, to the right. So for each BO number, we actually have one line. And for this kind of problems, we usually have two, two sets of problems. So in one case, we're given the time and we want to find the mid plane temperature or the axis, the temperature on the axis of a, cylind of a cylinder or at the center of a sphere at that specific time. Another problem instead, if we're given the temperature at one location, we want to find the time when this temperature actually occurs at the mid plane. So for the first kind of problems, we have to read the Eisler chart in this way. So we're given a time here. We know the thermal diffusivity and we know the dimension of the mid plane. So we can compute the Fourier number. Once we have the Fourier number, we moved upward until we stop at the line that pertains to our problem. So this line is, belongs to a certain BO number. So that's exactly the BO number of the problem. So once we have located this point in the graph, we can move left and then we encounter the Y axis. Once we have, we have the Y axis, we have the temperature theta. And once we have the temperature theta, we can find the temperature at that time T because we know the Ti, the initial temperature, and we know T infinity, the temperature of the fluid. Instead, 
if you are given a temperature, we have to read the graph in the opposite way. So we know the temperature, we know T infinity and Ti, so we know theta here. We know theta, we can move to the right and we stop at the line corresponding to the bio number of our problem. And now we move down and we find tau, the Fourier number. Once we have tau, we can compute the time because we know alpha and L squared. Okay, so thanks for listening and I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye.